We are now up to the third installment in this interview series that explores the world of legendary Disney artist Rolly Crump. Already, we've looked into his early work at Disney and character animation and his transition over to WED, where he worked in theme park design. In our last episode, we explored his early efforts with Disney on the World's Fair, and today we'll look at his later efforts on the fair, particularly with It's a Small World. And we'll also loop back to the Haunted Mansion. Unlike many attractions developed for Disneyland, the Haunted Mansion evolved over many years, with the project being picked up and put down many times until it finally became the mansion that opened in 1969. Rowley's work was mostly focused on the middle period of the mansion's development after early work had been overseen by Ken Anderson and before Mark Davis and Claude Coates took over as primary designers of the mansion that was eventually built. But elements from each of the early design periods made their way into the finished mansion. So today, we are dialing back the Wheel of Time to 1963, to a world of designs overseen by Walt himself, and to a place where a young Rolly Crump often found himself out of step with other more established designers around him. We are back during the high point of WED. So, if you're ready, here we go. In the years leading up to the World's Fair, WED focused on creating three Disney attractions, the Ford Magic Skyway, the Carousel of Progress, and great moments with Mr. Lincoln. The Ford Magic Skyway was a sophisticated dark ride in which guests explored the history of transportation from cave people and dinosaurs up to the present day and even into the near future. It was far larger than any ride at Disneyland. Carousel of Progress and Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln used sophisticated human animatronics far more complex than any figures in Disneyland. These three attractions, along with the GE and Ford pavilions, occupied all of WED's resources, with many designers wondering at times if they would finish the attractions before the fair opened. This sense of ongoing doubt was particularly true for great moments with Mr. Lincoln, whose stage show was many steps beyond what Disney had created for the Tiki Room. But then... In February 1963, executives from Pepsi-Cola approached Disney with the possibility of creating one more attraction for the far end of the fair, one that Pepsi would underwrite but would benefit UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Relief Charity. The attraction ideally would present children from around the world and speak to a diversity of world cultures. The offer to make one more attraction for a fair that opened in just over a year was not well received by Disneyland's chief of construction, Joe Fowler, who suggested that Walt pass on it. Even though Pepsi had been a longtime sponsor of the Golden Horseshoe Review at Disneyland and UNICEF was a worthy charity. The creative team at WED, Fowler explained, was already overtaxed with their current assignments. Walt, however, did not warm to this suggestion, saying, I'll make those decisions. Tell Pepsi I'll do it. Initially, Walt wanted animator Mark Davis to design the figures for the attraction. Davis was best known for the animation of female characters such as Tinkerbell, Cinderella, Princess Aurora, and Cruella de Vil. At times his work was filled with beauty, other times filled with comedy, but typically it leaned towards realism. He was asked to sketch out the characters and stages for the rides, creating scenes and gags. But Davis's quick concepts didn't capture Walt's interest. They didn't express the childlike sense of innocence that Walt wanted inside of this attraction. 
After reviewing his drawings, Walt considered his other options. The person he most wanted to call was Mary Blair, a designer who had worked intermittently for the studio in the 1940s as a concept artist and color stylist. Her work radiated the simplicity of childhood. But the problem was she hadn't worked for the studio in a decade. She presently lived in New York, so Walt asked Dick Irvine to set up a call with Mary Blair. Blair agreed to join the Disney team for the Pepsi UNICEF project, specifically to create concept drawings of international children and serve as the overall art director. She would also help in the designs of show stages. With Mary Blair on board, Walt now had just one remaining design problem. All of the other shows for the World's Fair were arranged in impressive buildings, tall, unique structures where the building served as the ride's marquee. The GE attraction was inside of a massive dome, and the Ford attraction was inside of a rotunda encircled by a ring of cement spires. Because of the short lead time, the Pepsi UNICEF show would be placed in a quickly assembled metal structure, something that designers would later call a corrugated barn. It was serviceable as a show building, but nothing to look at. For this reason, Walt wanted a tall, elaborate marquee to rise up in front of the Pepsi UNICEF Pavilion, a visual magnet to draw visitors to the far end of the fairgrounds. This marquee, like a smaller version of the Eiffel Tower or the Seattle Space Needle, would eventually be called the Tower of the Four Winds. First of all, <laughs> good old Irvine, Irvine asked Herbie Ryman to design the Tower of the Four Winds. And I went to Hinch and I says, John, Herbie's the greatest illustrator in the world, but he's not a designer. He doesn't know what the, how the hell to approach. I said, that's what I do. I do propellers. And, and John said, don't worry, Roy, you're going to be the one that does it. You know, so somewhere along the line, I'm sure Walt said, because it was his idea to do the Town of the Four Winds and, and uh, they wanted Herbie to do an illustration. No. So they asked me if I would uh, design it. I said, yeah. So I built a little scale model of what I thought it looked like. Because everything I did was in models. You know, no matter what we did for Walt, you build a model of it. And Walt always said, Walt, he says, uh, illustrations lie, he says, but models don't. So I built that little model, and then I took that model, and I did some little rough uh, thumbnail sketches for myself, and then I built a half-inch scale model of it. And uh, every one of the propellers actually worked. The tower featured spinning propellers in a range of colors as well as carousel animals. It looked as though it were made of tinker toys, a great big pile of whimsy rising up into the sky, enticing guests to walk to one of the furthest pavilion areas from the main points of entries at the fair. Rowley made multiple models, and once his designs were sent over to the Xeon Corporation in Los Angeles, where a full-size version would be manufactured some 10 stories tall, Rowley was asked to work on other elements of the small world ride. Mary Blair's primary job was to design the children, but the ride itself would be filled with far more than just those Mary Blair figures. Uh, it was interesting. I got pulled on on a small world all at the same time, there was a, um, it's kind of interesting, it's kind of hard for me to package it correctly, but first I was asked to design the Tower of the Four Winds. Mm -hmm. So I'm building a model on that. Meanwhile, Mary has come out. She's working in the model shop with about six or eight gals and taking her sketches and translating them into models. And uh, so the, the models are being designed and painted by her and, and these little gals. Then my responsibility is to start doing the toys. In fact, that little paper mache toy that's at the bottom of the stairs is exactly how we did the toys. We did them out of styrofoam and we paper mache over. And, and it was funny because when I was uh, looking at Mark's little rough sketches and they were really rough, and they said, well, how are you gonna make those toys? And I said, well, they, there are not any real, a lot of mechanical movements to them, and, they, and we didn't have any time at all. So we're going to do them out of paper mache. So it was my idea to take styrofoam and build a little figure, and then just paper mache it, and then hand paint it. And, st and still at Disneyland, there's a lot of the original ones in there. That are paper mache stuff? Yeah, that are actually paper mache. Uh -huh. 
It was only over the past few years that they pulled them out, made fiberglass molds off of them, and then cast them in fiberglass. Along with the toys, Rolly was given another job for this attraction. Though the toys and the figures of the children were being made in the wed model shop in Glendale, and though some elements for other World's Fair attractions were being mocked up in Glendale and at the Disney Studio in Burbank, Walt didn't have space at any of his facilities to mock up this fourth attraction, It's a Small World. Instead, Disney rented space at Grosh, a company that specialized in stage design for film. In the 1960s, Wed repeatedly used Grosh as a staging ground for various projects, including some that ended up at Disneyland. There were no working, there was no uh, working drawings on any of the sets. Mm -hmm. The models were built, they went to, see that was another project that I had to be in charge of, is when the models went to Grosh, because I'd worked with Grosh before when we did the bazaar, uh, they said, Rolly, you help translate the models into three-dimensional buildings. So I was over there all the time making sure that what they did was shop drawings. And my, my son loves bring, shoving that in their face now because everything is so precise and you've got to go through this department, that department. And he, he knows the way we used to do it. Mm -hmm. And he always is double checking. You sure, Dad? They were just shop drawings. There were no working drawings. No working drawings, Chris. And so that's how. So all of a sudden now I'm working with Mary, making sure that the sets are being built properly. And then what we did was, and also I had... 30 people working for me making the toys. Each day, Rolly went to work. Design was done at Wed and Glendale. Stages were mocked up over at Grosh. For the first time, he oversaw a team of craftspeople. He was a supervisor, which was a new role for him. There was hardly enough space for his team to work, let alone to store the toys and other elements that were being used to create stages inside the attraction. One day, half exhausted, he thought back to that psychic he used to see in Santa Monica, to something she had said a year and a half earlier. Well, then all of a sudden I've got 30 people working for me wow. in the largest room at WED. There was on Sonora, and we had no place to store the toys, so we put them in plastic bags and hung them from the ceiling. Wow. And I'm looking at him one day and I said, oh, shit. For Rolly... His life now felt scripted, as though this was where he was exactly supposed to be. That psychic had told him that he would be designing faster than he'd ever designed before, that he'd have a team working for him. And most importantly, she saw color up in the ceiling above him. That color, Rolly now assumed, came from the Toys for Small World hanging in nets above him. <laughs> I mean, she was. I mean, she was Amazing. right on the money. Yeah. Can I see them now? At this point, Rolly is working with one of his artistic heroes, Mary Blair, on a daily basis. He can see that this ride is an expression of her personal vision, something that she'd previously arranged into animated films, books for children, and an endless series of advertisements for a range of companies. But as this ride was so deeply connected to the way that she saw the world, Rolly wanted to include her somehow inside of one of the stages. Rolly didn't make any of the mechanical doll figures, but he thought that he might make a toy figure that resembled Mary Blair, so that she would forever live inside of this attraction that she had helped design. Whose idea was it to have the Mary Blair doll? The I did that. You did that. I did that on purpose. How did that idea come about? I just decided to do a Mary Blair doll. I said, you know, we've got to have Mary in the ride. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it was my, I built that one and, and made it. And of course, everybody passed it around. Yeah. And I put the yellow chicken feathers for her hair. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, no, I did that That's one. That's a very nice In topic. fact, it was kind of cute. Um, we didn't know exactly where we were going to put her. We knew we were going to put her in the ride. So... We put her in the Eiffel Tower with a balloon. The attraction was designed and built in record time. Pepsi-Cola proposed it in February 1963 for a fair that opened the following year. By the time the agreements were signed, WED had about nine months to design, create, and test the attraction before the components were shipped off to New York, where they would be installed in what was then called that corrugated barn of a building. 
That's amazing that you guys finished that all off in just nine months. Well, you didn't have to answer to anybody. You know, there was just Walt and you, and that was it. There was, you know, it was incredible. The last stage of design, at least for the attraction itself, was to briefly arrange each set on a Disney soundstage so that Walt could review them, looking at them as guests would, request any changes, and then sign off on them. Once all that was done, the sets were shipped by truck to New York. So then, anyway, then the next thing was to uh, mock up each section and put it in the soundstage mm -hmm. and push Walt through in a boat that was on wheels at the right elevation mm -hmm. so that he could see it as if he was really on the ride. And we put all the music in there, we put all the lights in there, and then once we got the toys in there, and I had Flitter and Jewels all over the toys, I told Mary, I said, the sets don't have any flitter or jewels on them. I said, the toys stand out too much. So she and I said, well, God, let's put flitter on the sets. So we ordered $200 worth of flitter, and the accounting department just had a fit. And we went in there and actually put the flitter on the sets while they were standing up, and we had to put them on cardboard, put the glue on, and they go like that, and blow the flitter onto the glue. And that's how we did that. And uh, then from then on, we... Uh, the other sets, we put the flitter on before we stood them up. And once this was finished, Rolly had one more idea. The dolls, the toys, and the sets were fragile, far more fragile than the dinosaurs and cavemen for the Ford Magic Skyway. He sensed that some of these figures would need to be fixed or repaired at some point during their stay in New York. Unlike Disneyland, which was just an hour's drive from Glendale, no one at WED could easily visit the fair in Flushing Meadows to make minor repairs when they were needed. So he created a documentation system that would allow these figures and sets to be repaired even if they were far from home. I started photo documentation for WED because he didn't have any. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I just thought it was so important. I know that when we did Small World for the World's Fair, I photographed every one of the toys I did and then made swatches of the glitter that we used on that particular toy, uh, the paint colors that we used. So when we got to the World's Fair, if it got trashed or anything, yeah. we had something to, to relate to. Beyond the attraction itself, there was one last thing to complete, to view the Tower of the Four Winds before it too was shipped to New York. For this, Walt and Rolly would meet photographers and a film crew at the Xeon Corporation in Los Angeles. Photos ideally would appear in papers across the country, but the film crew would take shots that later would be used in an episode of Walt's weekly TV series to promote the Disney attractions at the fair. Walt asked me to drive him down to take a look at the finished one in L.A. It was built in L.A. And then there. shipped. Yeah, then it was shipped. Oh, yeah. It was, but it was, uh, the company that built it was an engineering firm downtown LA. They were a sign company and so we uh, had them do it and when I went down and saw it I was appalled because everything got fat. This was six, it went to 16. This was you know eight and it went to 12 and so I was really upset with it so I had to drive Walt down there and Walt got in the car and says okay Rolly now put your seatbelt on and he says well, I don't want to use this seatbelt but you know he was so cute about kidding about that. I said, oh, don't worry. So, can you imagine driving Walt Disney somewhere? Mm -hmm. You know. So I got down there, and we took a look at it, and that's where there's, there's photos of Walt and I looking at it. And, and Walt said, uh, well, Rolly, what do you think? And I said, I think it's a piece of shit. <laughs> and I think I said a piece of crap. And he said, Roland, it can't be a piece of crap. It cost me $200,000. <laughs> and I said, well, I said, you have to understand, Walt. I said, I find that it's clumsy looking. And he says, Roland, he says, you're just going to have to learn to work with engineers. He says, I think it's gorgeous. He loved it. Mm -hmm. He loved it. He says, I think it's beautiful. But after Roly calmed down, he composed himself for the cameras, the film crew would take shots of Walt and Roly at a distance, admiring the colorful tower that rose up above them. And I remember one time when, when we were standing in front of the Tower of the Four Winds, and they were taking snaps out, shots of us, and they also had the camera going, and I said, is there uh, dialogue on the, he said, no, Rolly, he said, it's just, uh, uh, there's no sound. And I said, well, then, what do, if they're shooting us, are we supposed to be talking about the tower? And he said, 
Well, he's, we can be talking about any damn thing we want to talk about. You know? so he said, just keep talking, you know. During the same time, Rowley was also invited to appear on Walt's weekly series to present a model of this tower. This was a three-foot tower rising roughly from his hips to his head. On a sound stage, Rowley stood before the model of the tower as Walt explained the attraction. Oh, I, had, I had that. I think there was 80 propellers in there, and then that's the one that was on, I was on with TV with Walt. Rowley's one line was to explain how tall the real tower was, 120 feet, he said. And then, flicking them with his fingers and blowing on them, he got all of the propellers moving, spinning them like one giant whirlwind of color. But the camera and the audience wasn't focused so much on Rowley as it was on Walt. He made you so goddamn comfortable. Mm -hmm. He was just, you know, I, I, there was just something about him that uh, you weren't, you know, you weren't inhibited because he was so natural, and so he kept you natural. And uh, I know that the one. Um, one of the first one we did, I think we did two takes, and then the second time I was on TV with him, we just did one take, and I said, "God, we just did one." He says, "Yeah, we know what we're doing." I mean, you know, the guy was so mm -hmm. so sweet. The fair opened in April 1964, and already Walt had plans to bring back some of the World's Fair attractions, or at least parts of the World's Fair attractions, and present them at Disneyland. Rowley and the other Disney designers would eventually need to create new buildings and show spaces for these attractions, but initially, after the fair opened, the Disney team found that they had no large projects to capture their attention each morning when they came to work. They were free, to some extent, to work on or return to earlier projects that they had put aside to make firm deadlines for the fair. What happened was... Um when we came back from the World's Fair, they didn't give us anything to do. Walt was not feeling well, didn't give any assignments. And um, basically, I just went back and started doing sketches for The Haunted Mansion. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I kept thinking, and there was two movies that influenced me, and I told Walt this during the meeting. I said, Julian of the Spirits by Fellini had this incredible raft of spirits out in the water with float with torches and flowing banners and I said let me just pause here for a moment in this interview Rowley's timeline is reversed but only by a little bit Juliet of the Spirits would influence his designs for the mansion but not until the following year 1965 when it's released but this next film that he mentions does have a strong impact on his ideas for the mansion at this time and then there was Beauty and the Beast that was done in the 40s by Jacques Cateau with arms coming out of the walls holding torches. I said, I think that that's, we need something that's different, that's unusual, that's imaginative. In this film, walls were arranged to look like people. Lines of human arms emerged from a corridor to hold candelabras. Statues spied on guests. The dining table on its own, served guests. The Beast's castle here was alive, arranged with elements that held their own existence. Initially, the mansion had been designed as a traditional horror story in which people came back from the dead to haunt the house. But now, Rowley had two new frames through which to imagine how the mansion might be created. The first from the Tiki Room, which suggested that a structure might come to life with enchantment and that these hauntings might not be traditional ghosts of dead people, but primitive spirits who represented eternal forces in the world there to teach people something. And the second, now from the 1946 version of Beauty and the Beast, suggested that a house might contain the souls of the living and its architecture could be fashioned in part from their still existing bodies. These were the ideas that he took into this next project. How long did you work on the museum drawings, the Museum of the Weird Drawings? Oh, How long? I probably worked on them for about uh, six months. Six months? Yeah, because nobody else was doing anything. And, I, and we, when we first came back from the fair, because there was no assignment, we just sat around drinking coffee and reading magazines. 
I did that for about a week and a half. I thought, I can't sit here and read magazines. So then that's when I started doing the sketches. I started drawing all this stuff up, which you see up there, plus a hell of a lot more. And uh, because I just felt that the mansion should not be a cat in the canary type of, uh, you know, haunted mansion. I wanted to, you know, be imaginative and, and use the illusions properly. So I just started sitting there sketching things that I thought uh, should be in the mansion that were kind of mm-hmm. um, surrealistic and kind of spooky and everything. And uh, so I started doing that. And that's when the Candleman, I think the Candleman mm-hmm. was the first thing I did because I thought, you know, wouldn't it be great to have a man that's made out of wax and his fingers are on fire and he's dripping? And I even figured out how to physically do it, you know, with, with real uh, oil coming out of the pores and running down that would represent the, the wax and stuff. So then I just started, you know, drawing all these little crazy things. And uh, everybody at WED, like Dick Irvine and all the other guys, just thought that I was doing stuff that was too weird. And then Fergus, Big Jack, that was next to me, said, well, Raleigh, can I do some maquettes from your sketches? And I said, God, Jack, I'd love to have you do that. So he was building all the models. So we built this little table with all this stuff on it, a whole little solarium of man-eating plants and stuff, you know. <laughs> so I was trying to reach out, and you put some a lot of imagination into mm-hmm. the mansion. And, uh, of course, um, nobody agreed with me on it, and that's the reason I was stuck in a corner, remember when I told you. Mm-hmm. And, and then when Walt, when I first showed it to Walt, um, he, he, I think he was intrigued by it, but he didn't know how to use it. Well, I didn't know how to use it either. I thought it was, subconsciously, I kind of felt that it should become part of the architecture, just like the, the you know, the uh, Beauty and the Beast where the arms were holding the torches. So I thought that we should take some of those ideas from that and, and create, you know, rooms that, that all of a sudden comes to life and there's spirits in the room and then that's when Julie the Spirit came in because I thought the, the mansion should be haunted, you know, with spirits and all kinds of stuff. During these months, Roly had developed and was continuing to develop a very different vision for what the haunted mansion might be, something that was related to French New Wave cinema and mixed with slightly earlier tones of surrealism, to create an experience that had very little to do with a murdered wife who still haunted her husband, the sea captain. Some of Rolly's spirits were there to tell stories, but others to deliver moral or spiritual messages arranged for visitors to contemplate. These figures were all arranged inside of the hallways of what he came to call the Museum of the Weird. Mistress of Evil. Mistress of Evil. Yeah, she, you know what? She comes out of, um, she comes out of flames. In other words, there's a hallway and all of a sudden flames appear and all of a sudden she comes right out of that screaming with all of the... uh, banners, all of her clothes flowing, kind of like, remember the banshee? Mm -hmm. So she was a takeoff on a female banshee that would appear in a hallway. And she would be in the Museum of the Weird? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. she was part of the Museum of the Weird. The whole thing was staged like a real museum. You know, the big Mm -hmm. glass windows, and you could walk up here, but it kind of, the rooms were kind of here and there, so you kind of wandered your way through. I had one of the best ones that I didn't do any drawings on, or I did, but, um, and Walt had a hard time understanding it. I had the six sins of man, and what it shows is the devil standing, looking into a series of mirrors. And then all of a sudden, the lights begin to change, and each mirror, that devil becomes either greed, or he becomes pestilence, or he becomes death. But you use the same... A piece of sculpture in that it, it's what you change in here so the silhouette doesn't change in the mirror the silhouette's the same as the original one but the colors change and all of these guys and all it is is just turning on one light and turning another light off it's just a two-way mirror huh. and it was done so simply but I know that people would have a hell of a time figuring that out all through this period 
The idea of enchantment, the idea of the house that was somehow alive, like the enchanted tiki room or the beast's castle from the 1946 version of the Beauty and the Beast, stayed with Rolly as something he wanted to integrate and realize in his version of the mansion. What about the furniture that talked to each oh, other? Oh, well, that I wanted to do furniture that mm -hmm. stood up, that one chair. I actually built a model on it mm -hmm. to where the chair would stand up and, and then you'd project the face on it and it would come to life and talk to you. So it's going to have projections of a That's how it, it would be a projection of a face? Mm -hmm. Like the Madame Leota effect? Yeah, yeah, exactly. There was the beast man, the melting candle man, a clock arranged into a coffin as if to suggest that time is the pathway that leads for all of us to death, an aquarium filled with skeletal ghost fish, and then in the center of the museum, would stand the gypsy cart, which served as a type of home to spirits from around the world. What was the gypsy cart? Well, the gypsy cart won't have a problem with that. I don't know about the gypsy cart. I said, what the hell are you going to do with the gypsy cart? And so I started explaining it to him, and I don't think I ever finished. I wanted the gypsy cart in the center of a room, and it was just there. And then at certain, it was like the clock. Every 15 minutes, all of a sudden, the lights in the whole rotunda would dim a little bit. And I was going to use the black art where the doors fly open and you see bells in there ringing and all the illusions that you could do. I was going to have flames coming out the top. I was going to have the banners wave. You know, I was going to have the shutters, you know. And basically, it was a fact that the spirits that lived in there come to life every 15 minutes. And so no matter where, it was in the round. So no matter where you stood, something was going to take place. And all through this period, somewhat miraculously, Roly kept up a good relationship with Walt. They talked. Roly got a strong sense for who the big man really was. Roly also felt that he could be himself at WED. See, that was the thing. There was, there was just some kind of openness, freedom. Mm -hmm. There was a freedom there that uh, wasn't anywhere else, which is just absolutely incredible. And at Christmas, the nurse at the studio, who was one of Walt's closest confidants, asked Roly, of all people, to make a Christmas gift for the boss. A gift that would feature what Roly would later claim was Walt's favorite word. A word that offered a sense of who Walt was and how he talked when he was with his friends away from the public. It was... This type of intimate knowledge that Rowley treasured, an understanding of who the person of Walt was when he let his guard down, a little bit of knowledge that made Rowley feel close to the man who ran this whole place. Uh, Hazel George, who was his mm -hmm. uh, nurse, came to me when I was painting on rocks, and she said, I want you to paint a rock and says shit on it. She says, because I'm going to give that to Walt for his Christmas present. <laughs> so we got a little we got a little box, a little uh, Japanese box that had matches in it, which was a very beautiful little box. And we put the rock in there with the word shit on it, and then we put it in the box and we wrapped it up. And she said, I, I gave it to Walt, you know, later on. And she says, you know, he loved it, and you've got screen credit rolling. We still have a little ways to go with our story about Rolly Crump, including how the Haunted Mansion came to be the mansion that we all know. I'll be back next week with a new episode. As you know, we're an ad-free, listener-supported podcast. We do just two things. Deep dives on stories related to the history of the Disney studio and the parks, and news and analysis of current events as they relate to the Disney company. We are funded entirely by listener contributions. On Bandcamp, you'll find over 200 episodes not available on iTunes. But the best reason to join is to support the work we do here and to make sure that this podcast continues to exist. You can become a supporting monthly subscriber over on Bandcamp at dhipodcast.bandcamp.com. I'll also leave a link down in the show notes. Until next Sunday, this is Todd James Pierce.